All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, everyone, for joining this district-like webinar series. Uh, my name is Nick Steven, and today we'll be talking about the highly anticipated topic of 5G and transitioning into 5G. Um, I'm a technical marketing marketing engineer uh, here at Kemet Electronics Corporation. Um, and if you have any questions, there is a chat box to your right that you can post your questions on. And at the end, if we have time, we will get to them. So let's go ahead and get started. So here's a quick agenda for today. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, some history of 5G and talk about what came before 5G. Uh, then we'll talk about some of the 5G networks and then we'll go into transitioning to 5G and some of the uh, challenges that come along with 5G. Then we'll talk about 5G and automotive. That's a pretty hot topic, so we'll touch on that briefly. And finally, we'll finish off with some of the some of the chemical products. So before we talk about 5G, uh, it's important to know what came before 5G. So it all started in the 1980s, which is where the wireless phone technology emerged from. And the first generation network, it carried voice only. Then fast forward about 10 to 15 years, uh, we had the second generation. This is when text messages between two devices were possible. Then fast forward a little bit more, we had 3G, which a lot of us are familiar with. Uh, this is when we started using the term smartphones and we were able to make calls, send texts, and surf the internet. And finally, we have 4G, which all of us have right now. Uh, we're able to send messages, call, uh, browse internet, internet, stream videos, upload and download videos, all pretty easily. So some of you might be wondering what the difference between a 4G and a 4G LTE is. Well, to help understand this better, let's think of an iPhone or Apple products. So for example, we had the iPhone 5, 5 and we had the iPhone 5S. The iPhone 5S is a slight improvement from uh, the iPhone 5, but it's not good enough to be an iPhone 6 yet. So think of 5G, 5G just like that, uh, or sorry, 4G and 4G LTE just like that. 4G LTE is a slight improvement from 4G, but it's not good enough to be uh, good enough to be 5G yet. So let's talk about the 4G networks. Uh, the downloading speeds are between 10 to 100 megabits per second. Um, then the frequencies are below 6 gigahertz. And also the towers are non-directional. Uh, this basically means that the 4G cell towers, they can fire data in all different directions. And as you can imagine, that's wasting a lot of energy um, uh, beaming these radio waves at locations that are not requesting access to the internet. And uh, today's mobile networks, they use low frequencies because it's best to cover larger areas. Okay, so let's talk about the 5G networks that, that we'll have soon. Uh, the operating frequencies will go up to about 40 gigahertz. Uh, the downloading speeds will be significantly faster, uh, up to 20 gigabits per second, and we'll have less lags and latency. So all this sounds great, but what does it actually mean? Well, uh, the time it takes for two devices to communicate with each other is expected to be 50 times faster. So that means Downloading time for high definition full length movies will only take seconds. If you were to do that now, it would take about five to 10 minutes or even 20 minutes. Uh, this is all possible because the current 4G networks, they only have a few large centralized data centers. But with the upcoming 5G networks, there'll be thousands of new micro data centers under these larger cell towers. So the 5G networks, it can easily understand the type of data that's being requested and it can, it, it's able to switch to a low power mode when not in use or supplying low rates to specific devices, but then it can switch to a high, high power mode for things like downloading videos or streaming videos on YouTube, et cetera. So of course, uh, implementing a new network, there's a lot of challenges that come with it. Uh, the main challenge is the infrastructure support and cost. So I just mentioned the need for uh, new micro data centers. And of course, this doesn't come cheap or it's not free. So there's, there's a lot of, lot of uh, cost issues and infrastructure problems that come along with it. And switching to a new network, there's a lot of different security challenges uh, because of the flow of data and the open internet. So I, I mentioned that 5G standards, they rely on, on these high frequency bands. Uh, this enables more concentrated and faster data relay, but it also has certain limitations and other penetration challenges that will affect this 
early 5G deployment that we're looking for. So these, uh, these high frequencies, they're easily absorbed by humidity, rain, and other objects in the area, meaning they don't travel as far. So initially, the 5G coverage will be limited to outdoor or pedestrian-centric areas where frequencies can easily reach the users. So more towers and data centers uh, will be built to support these high frequencies and faster speeds. Uh, the towers will be low power and the data centers will require more power, uh, cooling, more servers and space. And this is where a lot of our products come into play, which I'll talk about uh, soon. Uh, and there's also a lot of new technology that will be implemented with 5G, uh, starting with small cells, which are basically these miniature cell phone towers that can be placed in random locations like rooftops or alleyways or uh, on light poles, et cetera. The small cells, they transmit using the millimeter waves. Uh, they occupy frequencies in the high uh, gigahertz range. Uh, these frequencies, they're high enough to avoid interference, but it's not it's not high enough to uh, it's not high enough to pass through physical barriers. So we have something called multiple input, multiple output antennas, or MIMOs or MIMOs. Uh, these are basically uh, wireless systems uh, that uses multiple radios to send and receive data simultaneously. So the 4G LTE network that we have today, uh, it can support a maximum of eight transmitters and four receivers. But with the 5G cell towers, we can theoretically support dozens of these. And of course, more radios mean uh, more interference. And this is where beamforming comes in. Uh, beamforming, they pretty much arrange these wireless signals, and it can increase their strength by focusing them in a beam. And finally, there's a 5G technology called the full duplex, which helps boost these signals even further. So just to summarize, uh, transitioning to 5G, uh, Devices will have higher computing and memory capabilities. Uh, the increased number of towers to handle these high frequency signals. And the internet speeds will be super, super fast uh, and it will ex exceed uh, the cable, cable broadband and fiber optic cables as well. So this means you can flip through videos and high quality content pretty easily. And of course, uh, reduced network latency. So how does 5G affect your daily life? Uh, so I, I already talked about movies and video calling. So you can stream a high definition full length movie um, in, in about 20 to 30 seconds. Uh, usually it would take up to 20 minutes. Uh, and video calling will be smoother than ever. You're not gonna experience any, any network connection issues or any buffering issues like that. And sensors will be implemented all throughout the city and it can track, um, track traffic, pollution, parking, and pretty much everything you can think of in a city. And the gaming industry will also experience a significant change uh, as the industry will move away from this console-based uh, console based system and they'll move into a cloud-based subscription service, which is more flexible for the user because they can, uh, because they can stream the game to any device from anywhere. And virtual reality gaming will also become more possible. There's already a lot of VR gaming available right now, but uh, with 5G, it will just be improved. And the automotive industry is also significant uh, because of the increased number of autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles. So let's talk about 4G in automotive. So uh, we already have 4G implemented in all of our vehicles pretty much uh, with the GPS, uh, In-car Wi-Fi, we are able to connect to multiple devices, and some of the newer, fancier models even have lifetime traffic light update. Uh, this is probably not a good feature for a lot of my aggressive driving friends. You know who you are. So how will Kemet play in, in these 5G networks? Well, the new trend right now is, uh, is um, more packing more power and memory into smaller package sizes. So this means higher capacitance and voltage parts, lower ESR parts, lower, lower, mag lower loss magnetic parts, uh, high temperature components for these automotive and industrial applications, and of course, automotive grade components. So ACQ 200 qualified parts. So uh, the devices will need to operate at a high, higher frequency, like I mentioned. So let's talk about a capacitor product that we have. Um, you know, this is what capacitors are, what Kemet is known for. So let's 
start off with a, with an RF capacitor. So what is an RF capacitor? So basically an RF capacitor is a capacitor uh, whose characteristics are favorable at these RF frequencies. So these characteristics are ESR. Uh, so the RF capacitors are designed to have the lowest possible ESR, which allows for minimal power loss at these RF frequencies. Uh, and some of the other important characteristics are uh, SRF, which is the serious res resonant frequency, which allows for a higher operating frequency range. And we have the temperature coefficient, um, which I'll talk about uh, really soon. So the capacitor, capacitor dielectric is chosen to have minimal capacitance shift across the operating temperature range. So pretty much the RF capacitor, the materials are chosen, and the design is optimized so that the capacitor characteristics are well suited at these higher frequencies. So we have the high Q CBR series ceramic capacitors. Um, like I mentioned, the temperature coefficient. Uh, so the dielectric chosen for this uh, for this capacitor is the C0G dielectric, which is considered to be an ultra-stable dielectric. And all the, all the other characteristics uh, match up pretty well for this capacitor as well because of the low ESR, uh, high SRF, high thermal stability, and the operating temperature range is pretty good. It goes up to uh, 125 degrees Celsius. So staying on this capacitor topic, let's talk about another interesting product that we have, which is a supercapacitor. So a lot of you probably didn't know we had a super, we, we made supercapacitors, so let's talk about that. So what, is a supercapacitor. Is it just a capacitor with a whole lot of capacitance? Well, I went to Google and these are some of the terms that I found when I typed in supercapacitor. So pretty much a supercapacitor is an electrostatic double layer capacitor or an EDLC. So all the terms that you just saw uh, are this EDLC, EDLC structure. So let's talk about this electrical double layer. So, uh, Unlike a ceramic capacitor or an aluminum electrolytic capacitor, the, the EDLC capacitors, they don't have a typical dielectric. Instead, it uses an electrolyte, which is filled between these two electrodes. So in EDLC, uh, an electrical condition called electrical double layer is formed between these electrodes, and the electrolyte that's used actually works as the dielectric. So since capacitance is proportional to the surface area of these electrical double layer, we use an activated carbon, which typically has a larger surface area for electrodes. And this enables the EDLC to have a high capacitance. So uh, we have two different types of uh, supercapacitors. Uh, we have the aqueous type and the organic type. Um, so other than these electrical specifications, there are two uh, key aspects to consider when choosing a supercapacitor, and that's price and la uh, reliability or lifetime. So if you look at the graph, up to 0.47 farads, the aqueous style supercapacitor offers advantage in price and reliability. So for this reason, anything over 0.47 farad, the organic type supercapacitors have an advantage in price, but their construction doesn't offer much reliability. So this is a typical um, application circuit of our supercapacitor. Um, so usually the main, main power supply is what powers the supercap and the RTC or real-time clock. Uh, but in, in case of a, of a power outage and the main power supply gets disconnected, our supercapacitor can actually, uh, actually power this RTC so we're not going to lose any memory that's stored in there. So for applications, like I just mentioned, they're used for, uh, used for these uh, high energy storage, um, storage applications. Uh, and like I mentioned, the supercapacitors are used uh, in RTC for servers and data centers. So uh, with the increased number of data centers and uh, cell towers, the demand for supercaps will also increase. Okay, so a lot of you guys definitely didn't know this, uh, but here at Kemet, we're more than just capacitors now. Uh, we have an impressive lineup, lineup of EMC components, magnetics, sensors, and actuator products. So many of our products, they have the capabilities to meet these 5G requirements, such as our, our common mode and differential mode chokes for noise filtering applications, 
And we also have power inductors that are used for uh, energy storage and DC to DC converters. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all these products for this webinar, but maybe in a future one, I can cover uh, some more products. But today we're going to focus on the EMC component and we'll talk, we'll also talk about a sensor product that we have, which is really cool. So let's talk about EMI. Uh, it's, it's not possible to see it, but there's uh, electromagnetic noise all around us. All of our device, all of our personal devices that we have, it's, uh, it's generating noise. So it's important to suppress the noise that's being generated. So why do we need EMI regulation? Well, our electronic devices, they're not allowed to conduct noise into the wall. Um, they're, that's called conduction emission. Then our electronic device, they're not allowed to radiate noise into the air called radiation emission. So by doing this, it improves the radio quality such as Wi-Fi. So like I mentioned, there's two ways of two ways uh, electromagnetic noise is transmitted. Uh, we have conduction emission, which can be found on the found on the power line. Then we have radiated emission, which is found in the air. So these are the different countermeasures for noise. Uh, for for filtering, we have our AC line and DC line filters uh, that I mentioned earlier. But for shielding, we have a really cool product called a flex suppressor. So let's let's talk about a flex suppressor. So what is a flex suppressor? Um, well, it's pretty much a polymer-based flexible sheet with micron-sized magnetic powders dispersed throughout the material. We have two different types of flex suppressor. We have the basic noise suppression, EMI reduction uh, flex suppressor. Then we also have a uh, flex suppressor for RFID, which is radio frequency identification. So the RFID technology, you can find this in uh, your ID badges, your apartment keys, uh, your subway card, uh, and stuff like that. So I, I like to think of our flex suppressor like uh, a sheet of paper or a or a piece of duct tape. Uh, you know, there's there's really no limitation on where it can be used. Uh, you can install it pretty pretty easily. You can cut them into different shapes, and they're super thin, almost like a sheet of paper, maybe a little bit thicker. Uh, and they're uh, used in portable equipment. And like I said, there's no limitation on where it can be used. So how does a flex suppressor work? So uh, let's think back to some high school physics. We have a current going through the line and we have the magnetic flux around it. Uh, there's two different uh, characteristics of our flex suppressor, but before we talk about this, let's talk about uh, permeability. Permeability is an important factor when uh, considering a flux suppressor. So the permeability is a parameter that shows how much electromagnetic waves a substance can absorb. And the permeability, it has two different characteristics. Uh, the first one is the inductance characteristics, or mu prime. Uh, this is what's used in the RFID technology. So this is used to protect the flux, or it makes the flux bigger. Then we have uh, mu prime, which is uh, the resistance characteristics. Uh, this absorbs absorbs uh, these high frequency magnetic flux, which is the which is the cause of noise and it can convert it into, convert this electromagnetic energy into small amounts of heat. And this is what's used for uh, the EMI, EMI reduction. So uh, moving on to some of the applications so far, flex suppressor. Um, the first one is obviously for EMI regulation. So uh, you can use it to suppress the radiated noise uh, coming from a circuit. And another interesting application I found is for descents. Uh, so it's used for um, used to suppress the internal noise that's interfering interfering with your Wi-Fi module. Uh, and the biggest market for this is uh, is smartphones. So you don't want other circuits in your cell phone to interfere with the Wi-Fi receiving sensitivity because a lot of a lot of the functions on your phone does work with the Wi-Fi. And another interesting application I found was for wireless charging. Uh, so if you if you're using a wireless charger and you place your device on the charger, uh, not 100% of this energy is going into your phone. Uh, use a flex suppressor to gather the flux and keep everything packed together. 
so these are some of the some of the different areas where you can find our flex suppressor. Uh, as you can see, our flex suppressor is pretty much in in uh, a lot of the lot of the electronics that we use on a daily basis, like our cell phone, um, laptops, smartwatches, etc. So continuing with the application, uh, here's another interesting application of our flex suppressor. Uh, so our flex suppressor is now available uh, on a reel, which you can use to wrap around uh, cables. So for example, your smartwatch cables, it uses a sheet of flex suppressor uh, and you can uh, you just wrap the flex suppressor around the cable and it will suppress the noise that's, that's found on the cable. So our EFS series flex suppressor is perfect for these uh, 5G applications such as base stations and uh, antennas. Uh, I mentioned high frequency a lot, so uh, our flex suppressor, this, the EFS series can handle up to 40 gigahertz uh, of frequency. So that's, that's, that's a really good, really good material. All right, moving on from uh, the EM EMC components, let's talk about an interesting sensor product that we have, and that is the pyroelectric sensor. So our pyroelectric sensor, they're uh, basically a proximity sensor, and it detects the infrared energy uh, from humans, from human body. Um, so some of the features, the main one here is low power consumption. Uh, you know, it's all about energy saving. So if you uh, think of a typical infrared sensor, it's powered on continuously and it generates a beam. Uh, and when something crosses, crosses the beam, it, it can detect it. But with our pyro sensor, um, it, can, it can detect the infrared energy from human and it will only turn on when, when there is a human uh, detected in the area. So uh, our pyro pyroelectric sensor, it uses the pyroelectric effect of ceramic to detect this infrared human energy. Uh, and pyroelectricity can be described as uh, the ability of certain materials to generate temporary voltage when it's being heated or cooled. And our pyro sensors use the pyroelectric effect of ceramics. Okay, so there's a couple of different things you can do with the pyro sensor to uh, to tweak the detect detection. Uh, our standard distance uh, is two meters. It can also detect through polyethylene material, which goes which reduces the range down to about one to two meters. Uh, we can also add a lens to the pyro sensor, and this this is this is an important feature for for our pyro sensor because a lens is not required if you don't if you don't want the lens, but if you if you add the lens. Uh, you can increase the range to about five meters. Then we also have a pyro sensor that can uh, detect through uh, resin or glass material, and this is mostly used for short distance distance sensing, about twenty centimeters. So let's talk about some of the applications of our pyro sensor. Uh, so the proximity distance, which is two meters, uh, an important important interesting application I found for this was for IC key door. So for example, so for example, when you're when you're staying at a hotel, uh, think about how many times you walk in and out of your room. Uh, as you can imagine, the the key door module is powered on continuously, and it's waiting for the one or two times where you're approaching the door to open the door. If our pyro sensor was implemented, it can it can be turned off at all times, and it will only turn on when it detects the key within that two meter range. Then the middle, sense, the middle distance sensor, uh, it can be found in conference room lightings uh, for TV, business phones, et cetera. Then we also have the, the short distance sensor, which is pretty much found all around you with the with hand dryers and bathrooms, home appliances, and uh, contactless switches. Okay, so our PL series pyroelectric sensor, which you can find on DistroLect, uh, uh, they're uh, low, low profile and has a flexible design and they have uh, excellent radio wave performance in these high frequency bands. So these can be used for industrial and home, home automation applications. We also have our pyroelectric sensor in a module solution. So, we're, so pretty much our pyroelectric sensor, it now comes with a circuit board and a microcomputer. So the so all the driving is already being done for you. Uh, you pretty much don't need to do anything. It's it's 
basically plug and send. So very easy application. And like I mentioned, the lens is optional. Um, and we have a couple of different color, color for, for the lens. Okay, so if you're interested in learning more about the products that I talked about, you can go to Component Edge, which is our capacity, which is our component search tool. Uh, you can find data sheets and spec sheets and uh, plenty of other information on all of our products and everything I talked about today. And we also have Engineering Center, which is where you can find different technical blocks, technical articles, uh, white papers, seminars, and other, other webinar trainings just like this. So check those out if you want uh, more information about, about our products. So Component Edge is search.kimit.com and our engineering center is ec.kimit.com. And we also have another, uh, another tool, which is a top of the industry capacitor simulation tool, which you can find on uh, ksim.kimit.com. So this concludes our presentation for today. Uh, we did receive a couple of questions, but unfortunately we don't have enough time to answer these questions, but they will be answered along with a couple other frequently asked questions and it will be posted on DistroLect's Know How Hub. Uh, you will also receive an email with the recording of this webinar. So please feel free to share this with uh, all your friends and coworkers. Uh, and if you have any, any other additional questions uh, about Kimber yeah. products, uh, here's my contact information, so please uh, feel free to email me. Again, thank you everyone for joining and have a great day.